The Brandon Peters Show may contain explicit language and detailed plot points. For more information on the show, stay tuned to the end of the episode. It's the summer of 93 at 30. Welcome to the Brandon Peters Show and the continuing journey of the summer of 93 at 30 series. A weekend by weekend look at the movies released during the summer of 1993. As always with us for this... We have from the rap coming from out of town to invade this happy little place. It's Scott Mendelson. Always a pleasure. I didn't think of anything quippy this evening. Please forgive me. All good. And the writer from We Live Entertainment, Variety, Why So Blue, and host of Out Now with Aaron and Abe. He's busy building his house of Hoyles. It's Aaron Newworth. It's a real menace. From us today, we'll be discussing. The weekend, that was June 25 through 27 of 1993. We got three films for you, two featuring uh, widowed people. So fun! <laughs> oh, so, uh, how's everybody? Given the order I I doing watched well. these in, I, I've so thoroughly forgot what the third movie was for a second. Oh yeah, that's right. Thanks. Okay, good. <laughs> It's a good one. I was so overwhelmed oh, yeah. by how much the other movies left an impact. We, well, yeah, this this episode was a lot. Like, I mean, there's there's a lot of directions we're going in this. Week. There's this is this. You know, may end up being our favorite episode, your favorite episode. But if you watched along, we're here with you. We we powered through, <laughs> and one of them was fine to watch, but two of them have left a lasting impression on my life in many a ways so uh but of course you know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna bring the news to you when i wake up don't you know i'm gonna be i'm gonna be the man who brings the news to you the gentleman who will take over this program is uh, conan o'brien uh i've met him a couple of times the only thing i know about conan for sure is that he you know he's been in prison <laughs> That's all I... I don't know. I know he killed a guy. I don't... Uh, and he... Um, he's been on the show, and, and uh, as I said to him when he was a guest on our program, uh, I hope for Conan and his staff uh, all of the success and the happiness uh, that we here have been able to achieve, and I sincerely mean that for him and his folks. Uh, also, I, uh, I hope that he finds it in his heart uh, sometime down the road uh, to invite me back here from time to time. I, I, I would get a kick out of that. Um, so that's, uh, that's it. I want to thank uh, Bruce Springsteen for being here. What an evening. And of course, Tom Hanks. The next time we see you, folks, it will be uh, Monday night, August 30th at 1130. Have a good night. Thank you. Yeah. Goodbye. Everybody. Uh, June 21st, 1993. A revival of Lerner and Lowe's musical Camelot with Robert Goulet as King Arthur opens at the Gershwin Theater in New York City and runs for 56 performances. Jackie Ogo. Goulet. I don't know. Uh, on June 22nd, Wilson Pickett pleads guilty to auto assault due to drunk driving. You on the you on the jury for that one, Scott? How old do you think I am? I don't know. All right. <laughs> uh, also on June 23rd, Nigeria's military dictator General Ibrahim Babanged, Babaginda annals results of presidential elections and halts a return to democracy. You'll I'm have to wait. You'll have to wait, democracy. Just another year. Just another season. The last and day. after the harvest, you can go with... <laughs> what you said when Biggs was in town. All right. So also, <sighs> also on June 23rd, United Nations auth authorizes worldwide oil embargo against Haiti. Uh, and on the next day, that, yeah, on the next day, a Yale computer science professor, Dr. David Geller, Gellertner, Gellertner, he loses the sight in one eye, the hearing in one ear, and part of his right hand after receiving a mail bomb from 
Wilson wait, Pickett? Wait for it, wait for it. Charlton <laughs> Copley? Because <laughs> he played him in a movie 20 what? years, 30 years later. <laughs> well, it can't be Jeffrey Dahmer because he's already in jail. No, he didn't mail bomb people, Scott. Oh, right. My mistake. He, he, he mail domed people. <laughs> <laughs> He cut them into pieces. He didn't blow them into pieces. Because he's male. And he's- Smash that subscribe button. <laughs> Smash that subscribe button. Do you like Dahmer on Netflix? You'll <laughs> love our conversation. On the, on the YouTube stream, I assume it says callback on the ton of the... <laughs> right. <laughs> callback, callback, callback. Oh, uh, June 25th, Late Night with David Letterman airs for the last time on NBC. And it was never uh, heard from the part again. where you explained that it was the Unabomber. I assume it was the Unabomber. It right? was the... Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah. The, I put my hood up and acted oh, like okay. I had I'm... shades because I have a mustache. <laughs> <laughs> I said Charles Copley. We all laughed. Yes. <sighs> I wasn't actually watching the Zoom video, but I'll take your word for it. Yes. But not a guest. Uh, Some David of us pay attention during the summer at 93 and 30. Right. <laughs> um, so, well, yeah. Him or John Wayne Gacy? Yeah. Hmm. Uh, That's our least favorite John Wayne. <laughs> it's a close call. Don't get me wrong. So, Let- Letterman uh, leaves NBC, which that was a big ordeal, which. Oh. God. There would be a reprisal of it a couple decades later. Oh, what? Were there, was there difficulty naming other talk late night talk show hosts <laughs> in the future? Oh, yes. Yeah, maybe. How is that not a movie yet? Some might have even gotten <laughs> well, the job and take, had to take it away from them. But um, the you know the, the one we're talking about now is Leno and Letterman. You know, when Carson left, that is a movie from HBO called yep. the, late, the Late Shift. You know, highly played, recommended. Who plays them? I don't think they're played by anybody particularly famous. I mean, they're in the movie, but they're not the main focus. Okay, there's like a not. there's like a face fat suit for the one guy to look like L- Leno in it. I remember. Oh. I think uh, Kathy Bates is the protagonist. I believe she plays one of the manager. Okay. Um, but yeah, and you know, at the time, it was this you know ridiculous inside baseball scandal. It's like, oh well, that's never going to happen again. And then in twenty. 20- Leno is kind of sort of leaves. Conan O'Brien finally gets his dream to be the host of the Tonight Show. And then ratings are bad and NBC panics. They try to put Leno on this like 10 o'clock at night variety show type thing that is a total disaster. So nine months later, uh, they throw Conan O'Brien out and bring Leno back as the host of the Tonight Show. Well, yeah, yeah. we'll, well, we'll, we'll they, talk about that in the summer of 2007. Yeah. Well, I, I think they pushed Leno out earlier than he kind of wanted, gave him that one slot. And then Conan, they're like, you want to go back to your old show for a couple more years? And then we'll, and it, he was like, no, fuck you. I'm leaving. But this happened with Letterman. He was supposed to be the successor to night show and didn't get it. Um, so he left and started his own thing on CBS, which is still running right now uh, with Stephen Colbert. So. And uh, he was leading Leno's tonight show almost, you know, consistently for the first couple years mm-hmm. until the one night when Jay Leno in the summer of 1995 had as a very special guest, Hugh Grant, just like a week or so after he got busted with a prostitute. Mm-hmm. And that was such a must-see TV event that tons of people turned into Leno and Leno took the lead and kept it from then on. Well, didn't wasn't it like wasn't there like a Letterman thing where, the, you know, when Drew Barrymore was having her bad girl phase and she like yes. flashed him and that turned people off like, oh, what kind of show is this? It's like, eh, OK. It's David. Yeah, I, I do not know the reaction to that, but I do remember mm-hmm. that happening. Yes. Yeah. So, um, but, I like yeah, Conan. Conan's Conan <laughs> rules. So <laughs> just throwing that out but there. <laughs> Conan Conan replaced Letterman for that that gig yeah. uh, on NBC. So. And it was an infamously weird off the, you know, outside the line pick. And that mm-hmm. first year or so, it was pretty awkward. Yeah. But he, uh, he, he's never done it before. It's weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, he certainly the grew Simpsons into writer, the job. That tall, goofy guy. <laughs> and by the time I was in high school, it was a pleasure to watch on the regular. Oh yeah, I was a long time fan there. And then in this weird history, we wind up with Jimmy Fallon being the host of that tonight's show. So. 
All right. Uh, June 25th. Uh, Glastonbury. Oh, oh, are we done with late night talk? We are done with late night talk. Is that, is that, oh, there's more. I'm moving on. <laughs> is, that, is that all oh, for wait, that? Wait, there's more. Let's, <laughs> <laughs> Let's not forget the Chevy Chase show. I the think Chevy it last week. Yes, we Arsenio Hall. Yes, yeah, so we were talking about the Foyle's pop commentary for some reason it came up. Um, James Corden is about to leave. Tom yeah. Snyder, what a chap. Um, yeah, we got. <laughs> Craig so Kilborn uh, got second place in a hot dog eating contest. At the <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, June 25th, Glastonbury Festival in Pilton, England, opens with the Black Crows and the Kinks headlining. Other performers included Winston Marsalis. Uh, what does he look like? Uh, Robert Plant, Velvet Underground, Hot House Flowers, Ben Morrison, John Prine, Rolf Harris, Lenny Kravitz, and the Bare Naked Ladies. Uh, on June 25th, also the same day, Kim Campbell becomes the 19th Prime Minister of Canada, although she would remain in office for less than five months. Women, right? Smash the subscribe button! Hit that subscribe button! <laughs> oh, on June 26th, Rebecca... But did she G- outlast ahead of lettuce? I don't know. Uh, June 26th, Rebecca Jones, 18 years old of Georgia, crowned America's junior miss. Love those pageants. Also, uh, that day, the U.S. launches a cruise missile attack targeting Baghdad Intelligence Headquarters in retaliation for a thwarted assassination ag- attempt against former President George H.W. Bush in April in Kuwait. Bill Clinton going out for blood there. Against Who rode Bert the missile Walker. to make sure it hit? I don't know. <laughs> I'd have to check. Captain America. <laughs> <laughs> but Slim Pickens still kickins. <laughs> Smash that subscribe. <laughs> yes, it rhymes. Uh, so also on uh, so speaking of Bill Clinton here, June twenty seventh, Don Henley booed in Milwaukee when he dedicates the song "It's Not Easy Being Green" to President Clinton. So they said, "Boo!" I don't get it. Either. That was a slam on Clinton with the song, or they're hardcore Republicans in Milwaukee. Fair enough. Or Clinton's like a noted non Muppets fan, and they know it. <laughs> mm. and... It's possible. He's more of a Fraggle Rock guy. <laughs> he's got a he's got a hand up his ass, that Clinton. This one's for you. So, uh, so our notable deaths this week: Frank Morrow, actor, uh. Jay Leno's mom, Catherine Leno, passed away the same week. He was taking over. Uh, former First Lady Pat Nixon, mm-hmm. uh, actor Jerry Stravelli, uh, Baseball Hall of Fame catcher Roy Campanella. And then born this week, got two biggies, Beanie Feldstein, she was oh. born, and Ariana Grande, both born this week to celebrate we will talk about our first movie, House of Cards. Live home video announces a film so powerful, a story so moving. Ms. Matthews, when did your little girl stop talking? One of today's hottest actors, Tommy Lee Jones of The Fugitive, JFK, and Under Siege. You really do need to come see me, you know. I don't believe she needs to be treated. By you or by any other doctor. Stars with Kathleen Turner of this summer's Undercover Blues, War of the Roses, and Princey's Honor in the widely acclaimed story of a mother's fight to unlock the secret that's trapped in the mind of the child she loves. I'm sure you haven't missed the fact your daughter almost killed herself today. Twice. House of Cards. She's alone. Somewhere. The Los Angeles Times calls it magical. Where's the father? Uh, Mrs. Matthews' husband died over there with some accident. In one week's time, a perfectly normal, happy, healthy child has presented a condition that is impossible. Come on. Four stars enthralling raised the San Diego Union Tribune. She doesn't cry, she doesn't scream, she doesn't even look at you. Is that the daughter you want so badly? She may not talk, but that doesn't mean she's not trying to tell me something. This kid's condition is volatile. We don't have time to play games. While Screen International calls House of Cards uplifting, provocative, and emotionally honest. Everybody goes off into their own world sometimes. I do. Oh, yeah, of course. We all do, but we come back. 
House of Cards is the odds-on favorite as the number one sleeper hit of the year. He's all alone. Alone in the mood. Come with me. Don't be afraid. House of Cards from Live Home Video. Directed by Michael Lassac, written by Michael Lassac on a story by him and Robert J. Litz. They were getting Litz maybe while this was happening. Starring Kathleen Turner, Tommy Lee Jones, Asha Manina, Shiloh Strong, Esther Roll, Park Overall, and Michael Horse. <laughs> Music scored by James Horner. A widow tries to find out why her daughter's strange behavior. A reaction to her father's death is progressively worsening. All right. Who wants this one first? Spoiler, it's not autism. It's magic. Um, This was an interesting picture. I forgot. I, Roger Ebert wrote an unusually vicious review of this 30 years ago that I vaguely remember reading. Um, And having watched it, I it's weird again you know I, I think if i had seen it in 1993 i probably would have agreed but now you know again sort of by virtue of what we used to take for granted it's like this isn't good but it's interesting and it's nice to see autism being discussed in an empathetic manner 30 years ago and Tommy Lee jones is spectacular he's probably he's arguably in a better movie one that was actually about the stuff that it pertains to be about without you know saying never mind it's really she really is trying to stay silent so she can hear her dead dad talk to her or whatever. Uh, very well acted. Um, but, I mean, obviously, quote unquote, problematic by virtue of, you know, saying, no, no, it's not autism. It's it's something very plot specific. And once you find the magic switch, she, the kid is back to normal again. Um, but in the moment, I, you know, as an acting treat, I was like, okay, this is interesting enough. Um, but which I guess is a long short way of saying it's not a good movie. I can see why people hated it 30 years ago, but I enjoyed watching it once and only once as to see Kathleen Turner and Emily Jones and just an old school drama drama. And that's probably as kind as I can be to the film. Kind you are, Aaron. There's a um, there's an old SNL skit with Will Ferrell where he plays a doctor, and like Chris Parnell and Molly Shannon come in and he's like lost their child, <laughs> and um, there's a point where Tim Meadows walks in, and offers like nonsense talk and just does the robot and then walks away, and Chris Parnell's reaction is, um, what the hell was that? That's that energy is what I had for this. Movie. <laughs> <laughs> And telling that story was more interesting to me than watching this movie. Um, I was deeply saddened to forget what year David Mamet's House of Cards came out because I was like, oh, this is not that movie. <laughs> now on Tubi. Because <laughs> I was very excited because I had, like, it's right here somewhere, my criterion of House of Cards. Because <laughs> that movie's excellent. This House of Cards is not excellent. I, I don't know who Scott's trying to appease by giving it a fair shake. <laughs> um, I, I thought you would hate this more than I did, uh, given your relation to autism, uh, because this movie uh, does feel just badly handled, like just entirely misguided as far as what it's trying to like say about, you know, children on the spectrum and children that have special needs and making that feel relatable in some way instead of this weird hokey version, let alone like... Do like there's a weird framing device that yeah sets up like magical realism and other cultures and how that factors into you know, this poor white family uh like there's so much going on here that feels just misguided in the worst possible ways this feels like the mac and me version of whatever better version of this movie exists. <laughs> um i i think like you can say tommy lee jones is doing the job here but i don't think he's doing anything spectacular he feels very bored in a way where Tommy Lee jones is fairly unflappable so it's hard to kind of register what exactly is going on in his head at a given moment but even with that in mind he still seems very bored in this movie uh i think kathleen turner is giving it her best in, in what appears to be a like a tv movie performance that happens to be a theatrical sundance release um but you know, this this was a 
this was not a triumph of will <laughs> that's for sure <laughs> this, was, this, this was a this was a, a movie that certainly lasted a lot longer than it needed to and felt even longer than that by the time i was done with it yeah i'm with you there i was constantly in shock of the turn like this thing had me like we haven't no one said anything about the yipping the yip 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 you know your fucking mind and be like is it gonna stop is it going to stop is it going to like this girl like when something goes wrong she starts this yipping that's just uh, obnoxious um it is this thing is takes wild left turns i wasn't expecting um like the the vr scene and all like i'm like what we're, we're going lawnmower man the mid nineties. Like I'm like, what? And Kelly Drew's like, ah, oh, it looks like a SNL sketch of like your grandma doing like sex VR or something when she's on it. <laughs> and, and also like Kathleen Church, she's terrible in this. Like, I don't know what you're, I was, I was like, man, is this just like an Oscar thing she's trying to do and failing? Cause it's bad. So the language of this movie, when they're trying to like be thoughtful about autism, yet there's a line this is not the work of a retarded child. I was like, wow. Okay. Um, She's distraught. I guess, but man, that's that's a bit vulgar for that. I know it's 1993, but just, okay. Um, Yeah. There's, um, okay. The opening credits, we're still going at the 12 minute mark because I felt like we were well into this movie and it was like, (laughs) It was like, you know, art design. I was like, what? They, they <laughs> so did like, like, so does Connolly Jones just have a run this summer of movies that were the end credit or the opening credits just seem to last forever? Big time. Uh, big time. They, summer. Uh, um, they, 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 they paid James Horner for the score. So like, we're going to get yeah. all of the damn score. <laughs> which, which I'll tell you what, this score is wild because I thought I was like watching Hellraiser at times. Like I thought it was legit going to weave into the Hellraiser. Like it feels like one of those like first two, three Hellraiser movies. And I'm like, James Horner did not do the score for the, like, was he at spot? Like, was it a protege of his that did? Because that was knocking him off. We didn't know it for years. And this was the masterpiece he was putting it towards. Cause it's really close to Hellraiser. Like it, like it does everything up to teasing the main riff of Hellraiser. Like it's like, Oh, now we're going to go back to the hell. Nope. The house of cards. Um, and speaking of that, the opening has this weird exorcist vibe. Like this girl's running around the H it ruins and there's these gods and stuff. And it's like, I'm like, what the hell is this going to be? I had to reread the synopsis on multiple. Yeah. To make sure I was like, wait, <laughs> this was, like it said Tommy Lee Jones. So I'm watching the right. Yeah. Like, when, he shows up. Wait. Yeah. But I had to make sure it's like, this is what this is going to turn into. Right. And it's like, I'm expecting a drama about a widower. Yeah. And you're like yeah there's this like almost supernatural elements going on at the beginning it's like what am i getting into where is this going i thought yeah, but we- it's, it's it's a weird fucking movie don't get me wrong no. it is a weird movie but it like, is. Not, like i hear like when you defend something like book of henry i get it like i could see where the things that were <laughs> over in that film but when i watch this this is this isn't like the proto version or the 90s version of a thing that we desperately wish we could get today this is just a bad fucking movie <laughs> like it's just, it's, well, it's just it was a bad movie shirt. that i found myself compelled while watching oh my there, gosh and i can't defend you know you're all absolutely correct everything you're saying and i can't defend it now any more than i probably would have defended it 30 years ago but it's one of those things that like i'm not going to say it's good i'm not going to say go watch it but for the purposes of watching it for this podcast it's like well this is this is interesting. I'm over time capsule viewing. <laughs> yeah. Scott, they like diagnose <laughs> autism and then they're like, no, no, we just have to find the right words. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like if Rain Man ended, it is like Tom Cruise just like slaps up and I was like, snap out of it. And he's like, okay, fine. And like they just like, <laughs> like walk down the street, matching suits, holding hands, and be like, we're good now, we're bros. <laughs> It's ridiculous. Yeah. It's a ridiculous movie. <laughs> it is. It's absolutely ridiculous. And I thought when Tommy Lee Jones shows up, I'm like, oh, it's gonna settle down now. Mark of life we needed. He's gonna he's gonna save us. And then he's just like he's he's newspaper reading Tommy Lee Jones where his glasses come down and he looks over a bit. 
it's over. <laughs> and that's him the whole movie. Like he's he's not telling great stories about dreams he had though. Instead, he's like, "Ma'am, you got to tell me what you different. Uh, what the hats? Did? Turn your hat around." <laughs> and he comes off as good because his yawning is merely decent, and everybody else is pretty bad in this movie. And and he's yeah. not and his. He's like not t- trying to heighten any of the dialogue like everybody else is trying to do. Um, and well, that's why I feel that he, he feels like he's in a different, more naturalistic picture. I agree. I agree. Yes, he's not like go. He's not natural born killer as Tommy Lee Jones. He's not going big. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's, but he, but he's still... also remember when Tommy Lee Jones used to go big every now and again. That's fun. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that or like under. Well, that's in a couple in a couple months. I think. We'll, yeah, we'll get there. He's not even going. I wouldn't say he's going big in Fugitive either, though. I no, like big, bigger. But yeah, yeah. It, it's a you know he has to be. He has. To I mean, be, if you want to see him just to like, loud. and this is you know it works because of the movie. You know, almost monotone. Uh, but you ever seen the package? Oh yeah, with Gene Hackman. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that that one I quite enjoy. Um, but yeah, I mean, you're absolutely. You know, everything you say is true, and and. I don't. I maybe I can't even explain why I actually enjoyed watching it, even though my brain knows that I should find this incredibly offensive on several levels. That's what I, I kept thinking. Yeah, I yeah. we're doing the show, so I'm sitting here thinking Scott's like has to. I can't. I can't see the because I kept thinking of Book of Henry for just yeah, obvious. yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm like, yeah I, mean, I was thinking he can't go to bat for this like he would for that movie. Like that makes no sense to me. <laughs> but you've given it the nicest. Like I didn't like yeah. this pass that I was like not. <laughs> I was like, "Whoa, is he gonna say he like?" And I enjoyed, no. but like, I I had enjoyment in at times in this for other reasons. In the like, what the hell am I? What that? Why did they go there? What is the VR? Well, oh, now they're building a tower. Like, what is? It's yeah. yeah this, this, is this is baffling this... and bad. Like, not an entertaining way for me either. It it was... This is in the dregs in films like Jack. As far as like, oh, weird, like com- comparison. That is best perfect. like awkwardly awkwardly structured movies with like a high concept of sorts that have big stars in them. This is like down there with that. And this doesn't even have the saving grace of the wonderful, warm supporting f- performance by well-renowned good guy Bill Cosby. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Jack has a crazy cast, by the way. Like, it's, yeah, you know, it's a weirdly it's, stacked cast of them. It movie. reminds you that you know when she was starting out, Jennifer Lopez basically became a star by being like the one good thing in several very bad movies. Mm. Until Anaconda and Selena, which got to be good in good movies. True, true. Are we true. done with this? Are we? Are we? Are we, are we, are we? Yeah, sure. Let's move on. <laughs> All right. So let's see what it was on TV this week. Based on a true story. Sherry! Her sister was kidnapped. Please don't kill my sister. Then she became the sheriff's bait. Kidnapper has a fascination with you. If he saw you again, it might trigger a call. Please let her go. The voice on the phone had no pity. The sheriff had no clues. The next victim had no place to hide. I'll be waiting for you. Can William Devane stop a nightmare in Columbia County Tuesday? Uh, th- uh, there was a show called House of Cards for a while, and now we, but was it also TV. not an adaptation of David Man House of Cards? It was in on TV back in 1983, though. So, but what was on TV? Number one, Home Improvement, on <laughs> ABC, but not. Guess who, guess who didn't come right right behind it? Normally it's Roseanne, right? Not Seinfeld. Oh, he wasn't raising the bar this week. Okay. Coach on ABC number oh, two. Oh, coach. Oh, they, they uh, ran out of baseball, so they needed coach. The next thing is a rerun of the of the uh, 1991 CB or CBS TV movie Nightmare in Columbia County, starring that is oddly specific. Starring William Devane, Jerry and Jerry Ryan, and Nick Searcy. And it was uh, the recounting of a terrible crime that racked a family and galvanized police in South Carolina in the 1980s. So it's one of those dramatizations of a news story that they like to do. With William Devane. On Netflix. With William Devane, yeah. Of uh, Rolling Thunder, starring Tommy Lee Jones. That's right. <laughs> That's a good Tommy Lee Jones. Which I just movie. again recently watched for the first time on Tubi. Because oh, Tubi is the best streaming service in the world. Tubi. And after that Super Bowl, everybody knows about it now. So uh so now n- number uh number four is another um TV, it's a TV movie uh called Liar Liar Colon Between Father and Daughter. 
and this one stars <laughs> in a million years. I could not predict that that's the words in that order that we're going to follow. <laughs> liar, liar. Uh, starring Art Hindle, Rosemary Dunsmore, Susan Hogan, uh, Kate Nelligan, uh, Kevin McNulty, and Jewel State, uh, Firefly. Uh, and it's yep. about a young Canadian girl accuses her father of child molestation. She's upset to discover that most of the people in her life believe that she's lying about it and struggles with the public backlash. So, uh, liar, liar between father and daughter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but the, there's a, there's a poster here. that says liar, liar, a true story. So they must've taken out and they, oh, the father and daughter. <laughs> The slogan, the slogan is the truth goes on trial. Oh my gosh. A family Great torn up a family torn apart by the accusation of sexual abuse. Oh geez, the gift that keeps on giving. Smash that subscribe button. Um <laughs> number five. It's McMartin, this motherfucker. Yes. Uh number five, primetime live on ABC. Number six, there's Roseanne on on ABC. Seven, 60 minutes CBS. 8, 2020 ABC, 9, 48 hours on CBS. People love their damn news stories right now in the summer of 93. And number 10, Seinfeld on NBC. All right. And it's uh, something that used to be a TV show back in the day is our next movie, Dennis the Menace. The family hit of the summer is finally here. Hilarious, irresistible, rip-roaring, family fun. Dennis the Menace. That's me! Rated PG. Now play. Directed by Michael Myers himself, Nick Castle. <laughs> he put a little bit of himself. Star, he put a little bit of star himself. of the Halloween trilogy. <laughs> 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 Written written by John Hughes. John Hughes. Based on characters by Hank Ketchum, starring Walter Matthau, Mason Gamble, Joan Plowright, Leah Thompson, Robert Stanton, Paul Winfield, Natasha Leone, Devin Rattray, and the lovable Christopher Lloyd as <laughs> Switchblade Sam. When his parents must go out of town on business, Dennis stays with Mr. and Mrs. Wilson. He is driving Mrs. Mr. Wilson crazy, but he is trying to be helpful even to the thief, whose name is Switchblade Sam, played by Christopher Lloyd, who has arrived in town. I want to note up front, Nick Castle was the director originally of Sleepless in Seattle and left that movie with after disagreements with Nora Ephron to direct Christopher Lloyd as Switchblade Sam in Sleepless in Seattle. Oh, Aaron, you have thoughts. Uh, I really hope that as we're talking, there are images of Switchblade Sam populating <laughs> various. It depends how of the I'll probably be lazy at this point editing these. So we'll this see. is the this is the peak of the summer right here. Switchblade Sam. Um, oh. You know, it's funny because last week we talked about True Lies and how my biggest issue was the fact that Tom Noonan's character is just way too like big. He's just so like horror villainy at its worst in this movie that's fairly lighthearted about Arnold. Where this movie has what must be like, you know, Christopher Lloyd, a, a man who's played the judge in Who Framed Roger Rabbit. A you twenty twelve, you twenty twelve, Mitt Romney, Tom Noonan, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> the big in monster this, was coming later. Yeah, in this movie, Switchblade Sam is like the scuzziest, like worst, evil looking character Christopher Lloyd has played, and yet it entirely fits in the realm of this movie because it needs to be that. <laughs> it needs to be the worst possible character because, like, how could anyone stop this man? Well, if Dennis the Menace is around, who knows? Um, that's Beans? just a part. That's just a portion of this movie, which I'd be happy to talk about at length because Switchblade Sam <laughs> is such an intense character. Like in a different movie, this guy would be terrifying at all times. <laughs> watching Christopher Lloyd should have had a whole series. This should be a series before the movie, and then they're like, "What Switchblade? Boys, Murder Spree? That is the Menace movie." And it's like, it's like, Switchblade Sam, Portrait of a Serial Killer. It's such and the score. I, I like. I hadn't seen this movie in decades, but the second the score came on, I was like, "Oh yeah, that's right. That's the score." Like he has his own theme, and it's great. Um, <laughs> this movie as a whole, I'm not going to say it's very good. I don't think it's very bad. I do right. think it's like it's like a warm up run for a movie I do like, Baby's Day Out, also written by John Hughes. All right, 
I think in the realm of like kids movies that are entirely built upon slapstick gags, I think that movie is actually legit hilarious. It's dumb. It's a dumb as nuts movie. But like <laughs> Joe met uh, Joe uh, Joe ugh. House of Cards. Joe, uh, <laughs> uh, what's his face uh, for Criminal Minds? Um, oh, man, Joe Mantania. Mantania, like Manganello. Mm-hmm. That's not right. That's the werewolf. That's uh, a Mantania. much bigger man. And Joe Pants. And the third guy, the big guy that's not Howie Long, um, like they're, they're, they're them dealing with a baby, it's so much fun and everything. This movie like has elements of that because I again I think it's John Hughes's he's the same in Home Alone, right? With like it has this the way he handles like slapstick violence, it when it's deployed well, I think it works really well. And I think the best stuff in this movie outside of Switchblade, Sam, obviously, obviously. is is the is the um mr wilson dennis stuff and i i do like that it's framed in a way where dennis is a menace but not in a way that's mean like it's certainly handled in a manner that's he is trying his best to be like you know have a sense of wonder and curiosity but not actually harm anybody and i i like that mason gamble and walter Matthau have an interesting kind of chemistry in that regard Walter Matthau is great in this movie. <laughs> um, Walter Matthau, by the way, people always talk about what, like, you know, George Clooney's next, Harry Grant, and Rod, Brad Pitt's the next, Robert Redford. Harrison Ford has been doing Walter Matthau for years. And this is like, <laughs> watching this performance, I'm like, this is where Harrison Ford is now, yep. watching Walter Matthau as Mr. Wilson. It is such a great It's great. But he's, but Matthau. <laughs> And, and it makes sense because Matthau in this like you know 60s 70s he was a sex symbol back then like it's crazy to think that Walter Matthau was a sex symbol at one time but he was so it's like yeah this is totally Harrison Ford anyway Matthau is really good in this movie his wife who's what's his wife's name it's Dame um uh what's her face um regardless the Wilson family I these actors are very like they are way too good for what this movie is like I really like these performances uh and Matt yeah and Matt Powell's Mr. Wilson I again like that he's not just cranky old man he's a man who's just trying to be a good person like he's doing nothing wrong in this movie <laughs> like the, the the worst thing he does is get mildly irritated and say you know say something mean to Dennis because like you just ruined something for me uh but like the the structure this whole thing is based around is like very thin like it's not a big mm-hmm. plot, but like the humor's there it's there's it's too like slight of a film for me to be like oh yeah this is an old kids movie classic but the work being done to make dennis the menace into a 90 minute feature it's strong enough where it's like it's watchable and again Switchblade Sam, <laughs> such a, 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 a unique like you just talk, Scott. You talked about Ebert's review. He hated this movie. Or no, he didn't hate this movie. He hated, he hated the character. He hated yeah. the fact that Switchblade Sam needed to be a thing in a movie that otherwise he really liked. <laughs> I'm just thinking, how is this taking it down for you? This this should promote it up. I was, I was waiting to see the three and a half stars on Ebert's review because bless his late heart, but Ebert had a prude streak here and there. <laughs> so it's so dismissive where it's like christopher lloyd's doing the lord's work switch <laughs> i've talked a lot so, what's scott where are you right, yeah. no i i actually rewatched this three years ago just during that you know nothing better to watch and write about during lockdown summer um i like it just because i mean again i i if you're going to make a dennis the menace movie this is how you do it and yeah, there's a case to be made that it's another John Hughes picture that's trying to cash in on Home Alone and in the same way that, you know, Curly Sue and Baby's Day Out and this and what you know, other films that I'm probably forgetting about off. Why wouldn't you, though? It's one of the exactly. biggest yeah. ever, yeah. more of these. Yeah. <laughs> and also, you know, here it works. It's not it's not entirely outside the realm of plausibility. And yes, the fact that Mason Gamble is young. I mean, a lot younger than the kid that played Dennis the Menace in the TV show that you, yeah. you know, some of us watched on Nickelodeon, where it's like he seemed like he was fifteen fucking years old. He's not, but it seemed, you know, it's like he's he's old enough to know better. Uh, this kid is young and naive and very innocent and has a certain literalist Amelia Bedelia streak, where he's you know he's trying his best. He's just going too far or you know offering answers to questions that nobody asked. That kind of thing. Um, and yeah, their their chemistry math I was genuine and solid. 
And, you know, I, there was a lot of whining about Switchblade Sam that summer. I'm guessing from adult critics that swear that something's too scary and disturbing for children, but despite either not having children or not watching the film with their children. And that's something that still happens today. Yeah. I mean, you know, I've countless times I'll read a review of a kid's film that I watched with my children and watched them enjoy. It's like, this is too scary and disturbing for children. It's like, I thought it was good. My kids weren't disturbed. I'm sorry, yours are losers. Um, Joan Plowright, that's who plays Miss. Oh, yeah. Yes. And yeah, Leah Thompson is as uh, Dennis's mother. The Back um, to the Future reunion. The, the reunion or Back to the Future, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I mean, again, it, it is what it is. It was one of those films that came out, you know, in the years after Batman, where Hollywood was trying to take every vaguely viable property that wasn't a movie before and make it into a movie. And, you know, production, you know, technology, production value, etc. You did see more like off you know, vaguely off-brand television adaptations than you did big budget oh, yeah. superhero movies. We got like Richie Rich, Little Rascal, like the kids' yeah, movies. You know, they're, they're Car rich. 54, um, Periscope, is Periscope down based on TV show? Yeah, whatever. No, it's, it's, uh, there's, there's Sergeant Bilko. Cause there's, thank like, you. Thank you. Which I liked. I mean, they're all around the same. Yeah. Okay. Fine. But they're all, yeah, they're all, <laughs> Archie. Yeah, yeah, you're right. They're all around and the same, like area. as far as yeah. that weird subgenre. Mikhail, Mikhail's those, Navy, the other ones. Yep. Right. Yeah, that was I was thinking of Mikhail's Navy. Um, as as far as those things go, this is a decent one. Again, I'm not going to pretend it's some generational classic of its time, and I don't think it was ever considered as much then or now. But it's a painless, enjoyable, colorful, well acted kids flick. Yeah, we we'll get to the box office, obviously. But was it it was it just yes or no? Was it a hit? Did it work? It's one of those movies that wasn't just wasn't thought of as a hit at the time. Maybe it was going to do more. I don't know. But at the end of the day, it's a thirty-five million dollar movie that did one hundred seventeen worldwide. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. Okay. Somebody made money. Right. Uh. So, like, honestly, this this is the first of a you know had some and a couple coming. But like seeing like honest to god kids movies that aren't worried about pleasing adults mm -hmm. is kind of a refreshing like letting them have something that isn't worried about reviews that isn't like you know that just like hey the kids have something uh you can drop them off of that while you go see uh Sleepless in Seattle or something this weekend um and that's just I don't know it's just like a lost art making these stupid kids movies I think Paramount has been on a run lately yeah of, I mean, even going back to the first Sonic the Hedgehog of kid adaptations that are kids' films first. Yeah. You know, Clifford. Um, I mean, yeah, the Paw Patrol movie. The Door of the Explorer right. movie. Yeah, yeah, the Door of the Explorer, yeah. Explorer, which was shockingly good. More yeah. people needed to meet Creech, though. That was the problem. <laughs> yeah. um, and good. even, you know, you know, beyond Sony, I mean, you know, Sony, you know, the Peter Rabbit films, I think, are very kid friendly first. Lyle Lyle Crocodile, same thing. Um, so I do think in some way studios are getting back to that, at least with certain properties, where it's like, okay, you know, this is a property intended for children. Let's make a movie for children. Mm -hmm. And because it's good, hopefully, then adults won't mind watching it with them. Yeah, I um, Yeah, I, and I thought this also kind of felt like testing ground for something that like type of humor snuck in here that like Shrek would perfect. Once we got yeah. to there, like there's some little there. I cracked up when Buzz from I can't remember his name from Home Alone's there. Yeah, he's reading him the train story. And he goes, "You will realize all trains are impotent, uh, important." And I'm, I got a little <laughs> chuckle there when he tells Mrs. Wilson about his parents wrestling or something. She's like, "Okay, come in, come in, come in." Um, I have to echo Walter Matthau is excellent in this, yes, and, and it's because. Right. He's giving a performance. They wanted Leslie mm -hmm. Nielsen. I know what that turns out to be, and it's not as good and it's not as endearing because Matho treats it as a character, a person. Leslie Nielsen would have been like, I know where the jokes are. I, I love Leslie Nielsen. He's good it's at what he wrong, does. Yeah. But he was already signed on to Surf Ninjas at the time, which we'll talk about later in the summer. Good. But Matho is good. What I love about it is because I don't hate Mr. Wilson. I don't yeah. think a hole. I get his whole thing. I'm actually almost on his side and it's more, it makes the, the butting heads of him and Dennis pleasurable um, and fun. Uh, and cause just seeing how, cause Matthau buys into it. This is a guy in a drama rather than a comedy almost. 
No, it, it's and, and it, because he's there. It's funny, like because he's he's funny because he's taking it that way. He's, he's not stereotypically mean. Like he's never like he like he say, he explains himself to his dad early on. It's like, look, I'm not a grump here. I just I'm trying to be a good neighbor. Like he's not, like I right. I don't I don't mind Dennis wanting to come over to my house. I just don't destroy my house. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> right, and I uh and. Like uh, we've been talking about Switchblade Sam, but he feels like this feels like a, a product of this time where they're taking these like kids and they're like, well, there's no villain, but we need to add one or make some sort of like physical means of evil that's in a human form to add. Because I look, I'm like, was Switchblade, Bl- Switchblade Sam someone in the comics from Dennis the Menace when they didn't? No, he was oh. invented for this movie. Um, the likes of which is Christopher Lloyd who. He's he's in a lot of these kids' movies things. Like he was in Adam's Family, My Favorite Martian, Camp Nowhere, Page Master, Angels in the Outfield, like Suburban Commando. Like he is kids' movie central. And it might be because like it might be a swift reaction on his part because he turned down Home Alone. So and then that became one of the biggest comedies ever. So then when you know Hughes comes to knock, he's like, Yes. <laughs> Whatever. But they were also looking at apparently for this role, Tim Curry. Uh, Michael Richards, uh, Daniel Tim, Stern. Will, Tim Curry uh, would have given us nightmares. Tim Curry. Yeah. Would have made well, it hold scary. on, hold on. We probably would have got an R-rated Dennis Smith because uh, Willem Dafoe was one of them. <laughs> Willem Dafoe in like what? Uh, what's it? What's it? What's the Lynch movie? Wild and Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Bobby, Bobby Peru. Bobby, Bobby Peru, Peru comes dead. Can the you menace. bring that Bobby Peru energy? To... But I think that's. But I, I, I. That would also work, not Bobby Peru, but like that would work though, because I do like that Hughes and whatever the work process was of developing this idea. It's it's not just we need a robber, we need like the worst, scuzziest, oh. like despicable looking, menacing character possible to make just that much disparate nature between uh-huh. what the rest of this movie is versus this figure. And so right. the fact that Dennis is able to basically torture this man in the third act is all the funnier <laughs> well, and yeah and like he is in his own movie until the very end of this thing yeah like, it's him in the it, paul winfield show yeah <laughs> by yeah. the way second paul winfield movie this summer big yep. Polly summer big Polly summer um by the way random trivia this was one of natasha leone's first movies yeah first this on-screen long. kiss yeah uh yeah and uh, this, so also the, so the finale of this movie, I was watching, I'm like, you could grab some horrifying looking stills from this end or, and make <laughs> memes out of people like Dennis, the men, like, yeah, like he, Dennis looks menacing. Like they, I mean, menace for real, like there's fire and he's like torturing him with beans. And then he, he like, harnesses his menace powers. <laughs> even in, you know, even in daylight, Christopher Lloyd looks terrifying. Like the, then they add shadow and like flame, like, yeah, you know, it's like Jesus. Even when he's getting tortured, he looks scary. It is who? Like I would say, it's if it didn't look so good, I would say this is a mess. But that was fine. Like it's just it's wild, and it's a good like. It's not this level, but it's like a Marx Brothers comedy at the end. Like it's so funny just seeing all the terrible yeah. that Dennis is like when he has to like he handcuffs him. And then he drops the keys and the beans. And so, now yeah. not, and so he has to feed him all of the beans in order to get the key. <laughs> and you just see him with beans all over his face. Oh, yeah. And this great shot of his, like, stomach that's full of beans. And I think it's just so layered of, of nonsense. <laughs> like, and, and Ebert said no to this? I don't know, man. Oh, man. What theater is he watching this movie and not being like, this is funny? <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, this, this is, yeah. His name is Switchblade Sam. Switchblade. I want like I want Fright Rags to make a Switchblade Sam shirt. Can they get like the Dennis the Menace license and make like I would wear it. And people are like, what's Switchblade Sam? I'm like, uh, this should that should be a Direct TV commercial where Christopher Lloyd reprises <laughs> Switchblade Sam. Hey, what's going on? He would then too. Get Doc out of here. Get Switchblade Sam in to advertise Direct TV. <laughs> I, I, I have a question. Like, so I noticed when I was doing research for this, like, there was a sequel to this movie, kind of, where they don't yeah. bring anybody the same back, but they they, they have Don Rickles it. as uh, yeah. Wilson. Yeah, Don. Oh, jeez. 
And then there's like there's other like attempts like TV movie or like straight to video things like dating back as far as what was it? So like oh, what was it? 2007 there was a Dennis the Menace Christmas um that probably was a the TV or no, straight to video and had Robert Wagner and Louise Fletcher. Exactly. Robert Wagner as, you know, Will Dennis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Dennis. But is this kind of, this is kind of, and Godfrey was in it. Wow. Okay. Um Gilbert Godfrey. No, Godfrey, the comedian. The comedian Godfrey? Yeah, yeah, comedian Godfrey. Yeah, the other God, yeah. I was, uh, I was, I was, I was legitimately asking you. If it, was, it, it wouldn't have surprised me either way. <laughs> oh, um, but like, this is a property that's like someone keeps will pick up, but like, isn't the one that like the relevancy is just like, like it's, the the nineties would have been like its last at bat, right? Like, yeah, it's like that with like like Casper and getting TV sequels. Yeah, Adam's Family, which some which has resonated again. Like, it's it, Adam's Family is so like. It has like these weird peaks and values, like yeah, movies, and eh, maybe not so much of the sequel for whatever reason. Okay, fine, TV movie. Wait, what? Animated movie? Wednesday series? Like it's, just, like, it's all over the. Absolutely, has been managed to like they don't. I think they don't. They take time enough time off and figure out how to recycle Adam's family because that the first one of those animated ones was pretty popular, right? That they did recently. Yes, um, and the second one did about as well as you'd expect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And during yeah. harder, harsher COVID times too, yes. right? Yeah, I still uh, like I'm the troll- shocked how well the first cartoon did. To be I, I still like the trolling that it was people fan casting Oscar Isaac and like what Charlie's there and or Eva Green for for forever as live action. And they're like, we'll right. put the best voices for the cartoon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they so like yeah they that that is a brand that's as old as you know this, but managed to stay relevant. But a lot of these like the little rascals and. You know, some of the others I mentioned, they're just like, yeah, they just, it's, it's Little Rascals, which is among like the best of the movies that came out around this time. Like, yeah, uh, Yeah. uh, movies that are enclosed in this period. That's, I think, like, if not the, but like the best one. Like, it does the job. Because I think, you know, these, the IP is like part of it is hitting the right audience with it. So if you could make like, if you bring one of those back like today, like, don't aim it at the adults. Try to refurbish it and make it just for the kids, and see if they can find a way to react to it. But well, and they're also also just drawing from naturally where the time period would be. Like we're twenty twenty, so naturally mm-hmm. you draw. From, you, know, you make it that seventy show remake, right? That, that's thirty. That's what makes sense now. Like you yeah, know, if you're making... well, <laughs> you're like making... when you make Wednesday, be like, well, everybody, you know, we never. She never. She's always a fun side piece that you could actually do something with on the Adams family when they do a proper thing with let's make a focus on her and reverse it and let it, the adults be the side it, but that, i argue the nostalgia for that is coming from the 90s movies as opposed to the yeah, sure. show or the comic right. like that because it's cashing in on wednesday's dark and weird just like christina ricci was in the films as opposed to being not really that in the series like i mean you know it's adam family so it's by de- by default macabre but it's right. not like you know burton light like it is in the movie true 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 or Sonnefeld. Burton yeah. Light, and then it becomes, yeah. it becomes yeah. actually Burton. Actually Burton. <laughs> true, true. But yeah, uh, Dennis the Mess, not terrible. It's entirely pleasant. It has fine bits. It has what should be a you know Peabody Award winning performance from Christopher Lloyd Sam Switchblade Sam. So, uh, you know. Yeah. Say so too. Uh, speaking of performing, let's see how Janet Jackson is performing this week on the top 10. Casey Kasem. Casey's biggest uh, she's number one again. Surprise. Okay. That's the way love goes. Same song. Number two, Weak by SWV. Number three, Knockin' a Boots by H-Town. These are all the same. Freak Me by Silk at four. Have I Told You Lately, Rod Stewart, hanging at five. Six, Show Me Love by Robin S. Number seven, Come Undone by Duran Duran. Finally, something changed here. And all I got to say is whoop. There it is. There it is. By tag team. Back has, again. Has hit number eight. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, and coming in at number nine, joining the top ten, Dre Day by Dr. Dre. Uh-huh. And Bad Boys falls to number ten by Inner Circle. So Bad Boys, Bad Boys, probably not going to make it next week. 
I'm enjoyed his time. But whoop, there it is. I'm not the best with music okay. now. Like I know what I like and whatnot, but like I can tell you right now in the ninety in that that period, whoop there it is was a song that I heard and played a lot. It was very mm-hmm. much very much a cassette that I had somewhere. <laughs> Everybody knew that, yeah. Everybody. Uh um, that, that and uh and the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2 soundtrack of Vanilla Ice. Those are the two things that are probably going on in the cassette player. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> so good. Um People were calling into radio stations, requesting it like crazy. Uh, just like some people called into stations to talk to, you know, psychiatric help people in Sleepless in Seattle. Smash the like button, folks. For more segues like that, click like and subscribe. Uh, When's the last time you were out there? Jimmy Carter, 1978. This Saturday night, TriStar Pictures invites you to a special sneak preview. I am having all of these fantasies about some man I have never even met. Of a movie critics are calling hilarious. One of the year's best films. A 10. Its magic wraps around your heart. Think Cary Grant. Tom Hanks. Meg Ryan. Ah! Sleepless in Seattle. Is this crazy? Rated PG. Special sneak preview Saturday night. Directed by Nora Ephron, this being her second film. Written by Nora Ephron and David S. Ward on a story by Jeff Arch. Starring Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan, Ross Mallinger, Rita Wilson as his sister, as Tom Hanks' sister. In law. As they were. Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, Victor Garber, Carrie Lowell, Bill Pullman, David Hyde Pierce, because it's in Seattle, and Francis Conroy. A recently widowed man's son calls a radio talk show in an attempt to find his father a partner. Sleepless in Seattle. So, to me, I after I, after I finished watching this, I'm like, this is nothing more than a cute little movie that I'm sure someone overthinking it has probably found some way of showing how awful it is and how bad these people are for uh, what this means for society or how awful we were back in 93. But I think in 1993, it was just an, oh, I had a cute time at the movies and it made me feel good. But I'm sure I can scour and find how problematic it was. But Nora Ephron did say, our dream was to make a movie about how movies screw with your bra- up your brain about love, and then if we did a good job, we would become one of the movies that would screw up people's brains and love forever. So there you go. Uh, that doesn't justify mixed nuts, but fine. I can deal with that for Sleepless in the Seattle. There you go. <laughs> there you go. The second of the Tom Hanks, Meg Ryan trilogy, first being Joe versus the Volcano, and then the third being You've Got Mail. So, Aaron, are you sleepless? Did you fall asleep to Sleepless in Seattle? I uh, really like this movie. You know, I always have. I've, it's the one I've of the three. Um, I've seen. I've probably seen the least. Um, so it's like it's hard. Not that you need to rank these in order to qualify them, but it's the one that I hold less high because I, for whatever reason, I've seen You Got Mail a lot. I really like that movie, and I think part of that comes down to the fact that I think Hanks and Ryan have very good chemistry together, mm-hmm. and this is a movie that very much deliberately holds them apart for so much of the, for the majority of the movie. Um, so you don't really get that; you get more of the conversations between others around the fact or what have you. Not a bad thing. It's not like this cast is bad. You've got Rob Reiner and Hanks improving it up at a clam restaurant or whatever, <laughs> and you've got right. McDonald and, and Ryan doing their thing. Like, there's a lot of fun to be had with this film as far as the different characters you get in that classic rom st- rom-com style, getting a lot of different opinions and ideas and f- just a sense of fun to go with the romance and the legit drama that's at play, given that Hanks is a widower and Ryan is very empathetic. Like, all of that stuff comes together really well. Um, it's, a, it's a very good movie. It's very... It, it, and it takes, it, it gives you a great reason to understand why Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks would be essentially superstars at this time. Because you spend, like I just said, a majority of this movie not seeing these two together. The two stars of this movie mm-hmm. not sharing the same screen. So by the time you get to the end of this movie and you have very little time to get the idea that these two are going to be together... The fact that you could look at Tom Hanks's face and look at Meg Ryan's face and absolutely believe that they are going to make that work and like feel something for that, that's very impressive. That's good A-list actor stuff. 
And so the fact that the movie is able to build so much goodwill about that because you just genuinely like these two people and you even don't feel bad that Bill Pullman's being, you know, tossed aside because he seems like a perfectly nice guy, but he's like, yeah, I get it. <laughs> that, the fact that they can make all that work, I think is quite impressive. Uh, so like, yeah, in the in the realm of these Meg Ryan, Tom Hanks rom-com movies, I think Jill vs. Volcano is fantastic. It's also very stylish and whatnot. And I think You've Got Mail has a... Just even being a remake of a brilliant film shop around the corner, I still think it has a very endearing quality just given the cast and the setting and the way Hanks and Ryan play off each other. This movie, it's not like the stars, the the ranking I have or the, the rating I have of it is any different. It's, they're all just really good. And this is just a very good kind of classic 90s rom-com that works. So, I agree, yeah. Way uh, better than House of Cards. <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Scott, you want to defend yourself there? Shots fired. Well, you're not wrong. I just was weirdly intrigued by it. Oh. Um, but no, this is a terrific picture. It wasn't, you know, the the discourse in 1993 was mostly about, you know, that this rom com aimed at women kicked Arnold Schwarzenegger's ass at the box office, and would Hollywood learn anything from that? Spoiler alert: they did not. Um, that being said, it rewatching it for the first time in a very long time it is interesting to see a film that plays on very old movies aimed at adults yeah in this film aimed at adults Mm -hmm. it's not like you know something like this isn't a criticism necessarily but you know you watch super eight and you're expected to be somewhat kind of sort of aware of you know the goonies and et and what have you but those are films that people saw when they were kids or there were films that were aimed at kids this is an adult picture even though i mean it's i think it's pg yeah it certainly yeah, isn't. Yeah, yeah. yeah if it's yeah and you know understandably there's very little it's, it's PG for themes that's what it says <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> thematic elements i guess no no and, literally it just says themes that's no, what it's fair says. enough <laughs> and it's you know again it's it's it it banks on the strong strong star power of tom hanks and meg ryan and that may be an obvious statement but there's a reason why this was this you know a year before i had a league of her own and then this was sort of the start of tom hanks's run as the biggest basically america's dad if you want to use the cliche but basically you know the biggest movie star in america give or take what tom cruise is up to at any given time um because you yeah, would follow this up later this year right yeah i'm sorry it's philadelphia later this year yes philadelphia yeah. was this this year he would win the oscar for that and then the next year would be forrest gump which he would win the oscar for that it would make 600 million dollars worldwide and then in 1995 he would do toy story and which, apollo yeah, 13 apollo 13, apollo was, 13 yeah, was another which, like is he gonna do a third oscar like he's just yeah. like yeah well he's which, great in it also so. which scott uh when we did the uh, Tim Burton retrospective. We talked uh, Depp uh, when he was doing Willy Wonka uh, was also recording Corpse Bride dialogue audio for that movie at the same time. Hanks here during Sleepless Seattle is recording Toy Story at the same time. So. I did not yeah, know that, but that that's makes how sense. old that's how old the the recording was for yeah. Toy Story. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that is a film that yes, it's an animated film from Disney, blah blah blah. But a huge part of that film's initial you know, appeal was it was a Tom Hanks star vehicle, um, and it was certainly a you know the character and of Tim Allen Woody. is also it is the, the oh yeah, yeah yeah I mean star yes the, the two <laughs> yeah. of them you know he was a peak fame because of Home Improvement but yes it was you know very much a star vehicle that was also an animated picture even more so than I would say the Lion King. Um, Aladdin's a different story because you have mostly voice actors that one superstar in a supporting role, but I digress. Um, the film, I mean, in retrospect, I, I Bill Pullman sort of gets the short end of the stick. I think he's clumsier and goofier and more foppish than he needs to be, but he gets a really sweet final scene and he, and he had a run for. Vengeance. He comes back with a vengeance and while you were sleeping. Yeah, yeah. He gets exactly. Yeah, yeah. You know, By the time up. he plays the the wrong man so often that, you know, while you were sleeping was almost billed as finally Bill Pullman gets the girl. It, a, um, a return to space balls. Yeah. And that's the weird thing is, is watching it this time, it's like he's playing Prince Vesper or whatever in this one. Yep. <laughs> or whatever that character. I uh, The prince in space balls. Yeah, yeah. it's it's. it's yeah, it's like um, Prince, Prince, yeah, she's, no, Prin- she's Princess Vespa. Yes, yes. And he's he, Princess Vespa. He's 
He's well, that I, Prince Valiant. Valium, they, yes, they, yes, Valium, Valium. Because Valium. Because yes. He says he, he says Valium, but he means Valiant. The chick is yes. Yeah. Um, that's when Spaceballs chat. <laughs> but there, no, this this it's not a deal breaker. It just it is what it is. Um, and a lot of romantic comedies will have some kind of other partner that must be not defeated, but. You know, sometimes defeated. I mean, you have something like, like the Wedding Crashers, where you know Owen Wilson has to defeat Bradley Cooper. He's like a villain. Like it's weird that they make yeah. weird, but it's interesting that they make Bill, Bill Pullman. Like there's mm-hmm. nothing wrong. There's nothing inherently wrong with this person. No, so, and this this was part yeah. of a period where he's I think James Hollywood's... Marsden in Superman Returns. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think they, I think between you know, movies like that and the Santa Claus and Liar Liar, I think Hollywood started realizing that. You can have more compelling drama in a comedy if the romantic rival isn't a dickhead. Right. Now, sometimes that backfires where by the end of Liar Liar, I like I, I don't trust this character. I don't want me or Tony and her son to ditch Carrie Elwells and run off with him because he's just gonna be an asshole the next time. But whatever. Yeah, he, he learned a lesson, but also Carrie Elwells is presented as so much of a dweeb in that movie. Like Bill Pullman's Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. he's a he's a decent person <laughs> like that's the yeah. thing like but they yeah they they go too far with like you just like bradley cooper is very much designed to be a villain in Britain. yeah he's he's almost <laughs> too i mean one of he's my issues with wedding crasher is that he's terrified no yeah he's he's legit like i'm so, i'm so surprised that i became you know much more yeah caring for him in other movies based on just how much i think of him as both like dorky guy and alias and uber bro <laughs> in in Wedding Crashers, A Team, Hangover, Hangover Two, like it's just a weird. And Aaron, now you've made Michael Vartan cry. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, Bill Pullman. It is interesting to see, like, because that's you know, I think that's what makes Efron both at the Efrons. It's her yeah. and her sister. They wrote this together, I believe, or, or she's a producer, and I think she like helped write, mm-hmm. the, like, it's whatever WGA. But um, that, those are interesting choices that the that the Evrons are making as far as we could just make Meg Ryan single, but we're not going to. We're going to make it different. We're going to make it, we're going to give her like layers to work with as far as hearing about this guy and having this other husband that she's not sure, having a fiance she's not um, entirely sure about. Like that's, that's, that's stuff. That's stuff that makes characters work and not just generic sitcom stuff. It also makes it, you know, understandably more of a concrete choice that she makes. It's not a matter of she's single. What has she got to lose? Might as well see what happens. Right. It makes it, yeah, it it makes it like a journey for both of them at the time to get there or just all the, you know, the obstacles of his, like she believes in the possibility of it and he does not. And then, but she, she can't just hop over to show him. She's got all this, you know, kind of, not in the way, but there's a lot of life to deal with in order for her to get that way. And he's struggling kind of to find and accepting whatever's there at first, because, well, well, someone's there. Someone like, you know, oh. someone likes me, but we haven't talked about the boy at all. Also his son, who is great. Mm-hmm. In this movie. Yeah. He, yeah. I mean, he's, he's, he does exactly what's need to be done. He's, he's good without being like, you know, too cutesy. Like I think yeah. the way he's positioned in this film even with the dialogue that's very, you know, stylized for a movie or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like it works without making him what's the word? I don't know. Dakota Coin. Coin. <laughs> yeah. He's not that jackass from Last Action Hero, that's for sure. Exactly. He's not that jackass from that bad movie Last Action Hero. <laughs> well, they didn't and they didn't and they didn't like the kid from uh, Jerry Maguire. They didn't do that to him back then. Yeah, he's either. not like, like they yeah. They didn't overexpose him for 2 years and mm-hmm. Yeah. Um yeah, I mean, this is, you know, 30 years later, considered one of the more celebrated modern romantic comedies of all time. Mm-hmm. And I can certainly see why it has a great pitch. It has a great high concept. It has two rom-com friendly movie stars at the height of their fame, at the height of their star power. Taking over and the also- 90s. Yeah. And also, I mean, this was back when Tom Hanks was still known as some sort of a smart act smart Alec comedian so you know they had a certain dry humor that he would occasionally dip back into afterwards but is it's almost like in a skewed way he, he tends to do like a one for him one for me in that regard yeah yeah it'll be that in philadelphia it'll be yeah 20, we're about to see the 13. change yeah it'll, yeah. Be, it'll be that thing you do and saving private right like it, it'll, yeah, it, yeah that thing you yeah. do i remember being like oh there's this tom hanks it's been a couple years yeah um 
and yeah this is the year where the shift happens where the more draw like yeah. philadelphia yeah. comes and it's all you know people want to see him but it's because people want to see him do that again but then yeah. there's also the old yeah so he's you know he's good he's at giving people what they want what helps um, is he's very, he is he's very good at doing that and he's very mm-hmm. good at doing that in different kinds of genres or different kinds of layers of drama because it's mm-hmm. not easy to be that charismatic and likable in a movie where you have AIDS and you're going to die eventually like you know yeah. <laughs> yeah. or be alone on an island and helpless and figure things out you need to be Tom Hanks movie star charisma to make that work for two Well there hours. used to be that joke when Philadelphia came out there's like I'm going to go see the new Tom Hanks movie it's like I have AIDS ah, ha, 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 ha. you know like <laughs> Well, I mean, without getting into a broader discourse, I mean, that's the value of having movie stars playing characters like that. Mm-hmm. It's it's and I, I know there's a whole conversation about, you know, should gay people, straight people play gay characters and you know, is, you know, what counts as authenticity or whatever. But for a film like Philadelphia, which is supposed to be sort of an advocating message film, you want someone that the unconverted adore. You know, you see someone that maybe to you is an other being portrayed in a mm-hmm. sympathetic way by someone that you love. And that's where star power is of value. Yeah, that's, the, if, that's the ideal you go for. That's yeah. why there is a, you know, that's why something like Green Book wins Best Picture. Because it's like, yeah. the message being that there's nothing wrong with inherently what it's trying to do. It's just like, well, what are we, who who's winning this? Like, who, who's... <laughs> who, um we need that's that's definitely going to see this it's going to be changed in some way or affected like i get what that is as far as yes you cast somebody because he's both bankable and because it can lead to a, a new conversation that's rewarding overall doesn't always happen that way like yeah, I, under- I mean you know it's but I, I would say you know a film like philadelphia and a film like quality notwithstanding i love you chuck and larry or i pronounce, pronounce you chuck and larry those films do a lot more good preaching to the unconverted than you know, something like Milk, which good movie, but not that many people are already on the side of the angels are going to show up for Milk. They serve as gateway movies. Yeah. Yeah. That's Cause they, actually, cause, yeah. Because they meet them at some point, at some terms, but then start educating them once they've related. And, uh, and you know, it's it's no secret. Were that, we not know, supposed to root for Josh Rowland and Milk? Is that not how it was? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, Hit that subscribe button. <laughs> uh, Sleep with Seattle. Um, it is well, like being well acted. Um, it's a real like because this this gets undersung. Nora Ephron knows what she's doing as a filmmaker. It's a well made. movie. Oh yeah, yeah. It's yes. a working movie. It sounds like it has a good score. Like it 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 feels of its time without feeling like stuck in the nineties. If you know what I mean. Like it has a certain. I want to, I don't want to say timeless, but it feels very deliberate in the choices it's making without making those choices feel reflective of specifically the nineties. Well, and I, one thing I like about the movie's like pace is like it it feels relaxed and not stressed. Like yeah. it, you don't like because there, there's other filmmakers that could have pushed the limits of the time constraint, the Meg Ryan situation, getting to places, but it feels very casual. It lets people live their lives and be like not like ah out of here but like I, I just watching i'm just like calmed by the uh, kind of calmed by this movie yeah. even though there are stakes there is you know wanting them to get together but i kind of feel like if they don't things will be okay i just really want to see them together yeah, really you know like have, like and the characters feel like it, it's when you have o'donnell and meg right like just having conversations it makes like a lot like it works it feels good to like have characters that seem like friends have realistic conversation or at least ones that don't feel out of the ordinary they feel fitting of the story obviously but it's it's done well and they're shot well and they're blocked well like it's a good i just i want to emphasize that because i think i do think yeah. Effort was a good filmmaker beyond just mm-hmm. like being known for rom-coms like she knew how to direct movies rom-coms can be made well too yeah like uh. Uh, like, like like uh what's it tom hanks has a i know this because tom hanks has like a houseboat thing or whatever right and uh mm-hmm. my, my my lovely girlfriend she did like a whole college project about like the production design of that movie like it's it's neat to think about it in like these regards and not just looking at it from like the star aspect or whatever. Right. And this also, was her second directorial feature. Yeah. And, and um, a big one. Um, you mentioned, uh, Sarah, I'd like to note Aaron, the, uh, summer O'Donnell begins. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, one thing I, one scene I like that I just don't think would exist in a movie today because they play things too safe and they'd be worried about, uh, 
one scene being offending both sides of people for some reason. The rep- film is the when Tom Hanks and Victor Garber are giving Rita Wilson shit about crying during <laughs> movies and they're talking about the dirty dozen. I love it. It's, <laughs> it's hilarious in ways and it's allowing men to be like a hole, you know, like, like stupid. But I can see today someone shying away from a scene like that because. You might piss off women. You might piss off the guys. You might piss off people who like that. Like, and they just that gets left alone. But back, it's nice to see people being like fucking human in these things and not like algorithm scripting. The that best to happen. You, you, you can tell there's a lot of great collaboration between Hanks and Efron in this kind of thing. When between this and and you've got mail because there's a lot of like, what if Hanks just riffed on a movie he liked for like five minutes and it's like right. That was- doesn't it's godfather and you've got mail like he just gets to just like play around and it entirely feels like what if my character just like had some fun for a sec like and, and that fits because like you're saying it's this mm-hmm. kind of relaxed but you've got mail is very similar where there's a lot of just scenes of them enjoying the space yeah yes very yeah welcome. it's very welcome in yeah movies. yeah there's probably a lot cut from this movie just letting people go or something but like everybody feels comfortable in their own shoes they feel like lived in they they the side character casting in these things is always important Great. and it's good here. Uh, like it, it just, it's fun. It works. It's, you can see exactly why this is a, you know, pivotal, you know, piece of romantic comedy uh, through the year cinema. And um, yeah, I, I just, it's impressive. And the, you know, the notable thing is they share two minutes of screen time together in this whole movie and they don't get together till the very end. And just kind of a dumbfounded, okay, well, I guess we'll try it, um, <laughs> type thing. And but the fact that it's so romantic with them not even together, like it's crazy. Um, but that's the magic of this movie. Yeah, it's a uh, it. Yeah, like it. The side it's, it's a, it's a, you know, not to be a broken record, but it's a solid, solid, well-made studio programmer. Yeah. Back during a time when, to a certain extent, this, this level of competence and craft was more or less taken for granted. Yeah, you, can people... tr- you can trust having, like, just a good cast and, a, you know, a solid premise. And I like it when it, with these kind of rom-coms where it's like them and the friends as opposed to them and the family. Where, like, like when Harry met Sally similar, right, where it's like, let's... Just have them with like their yeah, and see how that works. Where I noticed this trend in rom coms, where like something like and there's good examples, but like sleepless uh, sleep um when when uh, while you're sleeping mm-hmm. or my best friend's wedding, it's like it's not just the friends and the couple, it's and their whole family's here too. And look at our family <laughs> wacky, look at Peter Boyle or whoever back there doing his thing. Like <laughs> that's a weird trend where it's like we gotta get everybody involved. I guess Moonstruck yeah. is the real. The oh real gosh, yeah. That one. But that's that, that movie's fucking amazing. So. Yep. Oh yeah. No, they, they um, yeah, they, they. I don't know where to go with that, but no, it worked out. Uh, we only got we only get this casting of the movie because I guess Hanks and Ryan were supposed to do a movie called Inns of New England for Lawrence Kasdan, but. Uh, it got canceled uh, for budget reasons, and they just Sounds like a real snooze fest. Wandered in- over to Studio B and filmed Su- Sleepless in Seattle ends of new england yeah i don't like how that sounds already that sounds like far and away again and nobody wants <laughs> that yeah um and this one also was the first film to use the brand new tristar logo that would run yeah. until 2015 <laughs> monumental monumental but yeah this is i mean this is hanks and ryan ascending to top of the world of course we still have tom hanks all the time and meg ryan became steve gutenberg of the 90s but happened <laughs> i guess but i mean i mean is that she was like on top of the world and then proof of life <laughs> yeah I, I, um but her, I, so, her son's I, I, doing very well you, you can point to that exact example it's that yep. exact movie <laughs> that's where things just seem it, that, it, like in the cut sure is after that but proof of life that's where it's just like just immediately gone, like, gone. Well, i mean I don't necessarily subscribe to the theory that her career entirely capsized just because of the backlash of her, you know, cheating on Dennis Quaid with Russell Crowe, but it certainly didn't help. I mean, and I think other reason, Scott, so I've been welcome to hear it. Well, I just think it's the general downturn in rom-coms as a mainstream genre, right? Around other that actors as it prevailed. Yeah, yeah um, but, you, but you were still getting, yeah, the rom-coms, yeah. you're still getting them. Others are still doing it. <laughs> How to Lose um, a Guy in 10 Days, that was huge. Um, 
Maybe it was just that. I mean, I'm saying yeah. it's literally that movie. Yeah. Like 2000. It's not like it ended right then. They ended in like 2010. Like that's what rom coms. Yeah. Are. Yeah. We always <laughs> argued about the McConaughey that he was already doing well. He was just doing rom coms. Yeah. Like it was. Oh, it, yeah. It's so they were still the prevalent. They were still doing good. Movie that she it's pr- did. it's pr- it's pr- uh, uh, with with Omar. Good. Yes. Not Omar. Um, the other one. Um, Epps. Or Epps. Sorry. Omar. Juice. Juice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on the ropes or against the, yes, against, the yeah. against the ropes. But no, proof me. of life. You know, she got in that helicopter with David Morris and got the fuck out of rom coms. That's what happened to that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But she did Kate and Leopold, which did okay. And then in the cut, that was her the passing ropes. the torch to Hugh Jackman. Yeah. Like, you exactly. be the star yeah. now. <laughs> yeah. And then she just didn't do rom coms again, more or less. Movies. <laughs> she didn't do like much. She started you know, fading. She was, yeah, she does. Yeah, but she's, she's really not there. vanished until the end of the two thousands. Yeah. You but, can say you can say end of two thousands all you want because you have a list in front of you. No yeah. one can name a Meg Ryan movie <laughs> that, yep. that is after Past Kate, Kate Leopold. Leopold. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. no one's looking at you and saying, "Oh yeah, the women that came out." Like no one cares. Like, <laughs> you mean Serious Midnight wasn't a comeback vehicle? <laughs> oh. oh. But, yeah. Either way, it's our loss. Yeah, Sleep in Seattle, uh, classic for a reason, still good, and yeah, a great way to cap off this episode. But before we head on to the box office, let's uh, once again visit the video store for the rental collections from Yancey's Tales from the Video Store. When you're a major star, you do things in a big way. Big cars, big house. Big ego. Big ego. So when I want a movie, I want a big selection. No, no, no. I mean really big. Like at Major Video. Here's big news for kids. Nintendo. Loaded with surprises. Nintendo. Packed with punch. Nintendo. Now rent a wide variety of Nintendo games at Major Video, the Super Video Store. Basically where I grew up, when I was living in the house where I lived, where I rented Day of the Dead and dropped those 20s, mm-hmm. it, it was on, it was right on PCH, uh, Pacific Coast Highway, right across the street from a big Ralph's and the big Hermosa Beach windmill. And if you went, I'm never good with directions, but if you went north on your bicycle for 30 minutes, you would pass video archives on the way to the Manhattan Mall where they had a Man 6 movie theater where I saw Batman and everything okay. else. And so every Sunday of my life, I biked past video archives and my father and i used to go in um because they did have a really good selection especially when they first started probably before the porn if they, if they had porn at this time i don't know but they had stuff like and i hate to say it that but they had stuff like the tv version of amos and andy which was actually black actors for what it's worth it was not the black face stuff mm-hmm. but my dad was a big fan of that they had the whole amos and andy vhs set but and no one else did music plus wouldn't have that the chain stores wouldn't so i've been in there a few times and then To the opposite of where I live, if you went in the same direction for about 30 minutes, so south, you would pass my high school that I eventually went to later on and walked to the whole time, Redondo Union High School. And if you went another 10 minutes, you would see video outtakes, which is the sort of alternate sister store of video archives. And they're connected in ways I've never quite understood. Some arcane, some dark ways, but they're basically sort of sister stores. One you never hear about, which is video outtakes. And Video Outtakes was like such an incredible, it was run by this guy called Dean and he wore like a, a, a he dressed like the captain in Gilligan's Island and he lived behind the video <laughs> store with, uh, in, in, a, in a camper. And his, the only other person who I remember working there was his son, Tony. Okay. And one time we all thought uh, Steve had been killed because he was missing for a few days and we thought that Tony had killed him. Oh, gosh. <laughs> that's not, that's a, that's a different video store. That's a different video store story. But, um, so basically these two it, there's a guy called robert who's another really good friend of mine who actually got me the job working at video archives and he worked at video archives for years and years he may have actually been the guy who replaced quentin tarantino when he left for all i know he would he worked there for three years when i was a customer most of the time at archives by myself mm-hmm. robert was the guy i got to know he was my buddy robert was the guy who convinced me that john carpenter was great which of course he was right about and so one day robert and steve and i were at video outtakes and Dean, who ran the place, was un- un- unflappable. He didn't care what you rented. Obviously, they also had a huge porn section. And this place was so intense that it was a pretty tiny store. So mm-hmm. most of the video, the most of the video boxes, which were broken down, meaning they'd taken out the foam and flattened it out 
and you had to rifle through these laminated VHS covers. He had so many videos in the back there, but he could barely get around this guy. He was pretty old and and, and large. So, you you know, yeah. part of your heart always broke when you gave him a, a stack of videos to get because it would take him 10 minutes to go back to there and get him. But anyway, young men are not always considered and whatever. I was there with Steve and Robert one time. Robert, who I mentioned from, from archives and Steve, who's this crazy guy that hates me now. And who also worked at archives, actually, at the, very <laughs> end. At, the very, at the very end. I met him at video archives while I was working there, and he was a customer. Anyway, he and I, the three of us were video outtakes, and we thought, let's try to flap Unflappable Dean by giving him a choice of three rental, by bringing him three movies to rent that are thematically tied. So we brought up to him the VHS boxes of Fist with Sylvester Stallone, Fingers with Harvey Keitel, and Dick with, you know, Kirsten Dunst. Yeah, it was the masturbation theme. We brought up fist fingers and dick. We <laughs> thought it was hilarious. He just rented us the movies, four tapes because fist was two tapes. Oh, okay. I, you know, so we just took the movies. Nobody thought it was funny but us, and perhaps <laughs> one or two of your <laughs> listeners. Um, <laughs> I, that is good. What it was fist that long? I can't. Remember. This is like a hundred and it was two VHS tapes. I think. Oh gosh. Okay. <laughs> All right. Now we're back with the box office. Scott, how did? Were the dinos yes. beginning extinction here? or No. Oh, no. What happened? $27.69 million in weekend three for a 28% drop. Actually added seven screens for a 2,444 screen total, or bringing its 17-day cum to $171 million domestic on its way to 357 domestic and approximately 925 worldwide, not counting any re-releases, of which there would be a few. Uh, Sleep the Seattle came in second place with seven seventeen point two five million dollars. Um, it would eventually earn, I think, two twenty two. Yeah, something crazy. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, but again, movies made money back then. You know, it wasn't this kind of do or die madness that we see today. I'm stalling because I need to hold on a second. Da, 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 da. I had the page open, but I closed it. Yeah, two hundred twenty eight million dollars on a twenty one million dollar budget worldwide. Uh, what was that? Worldwide? A sleepless in Seattle. $21 million. Worldwide? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes, worldwide. Uh, domestically, it made, I think, like 115, 127. Uh, Dennis the Menace was in third place with $9.3 million on its way to a $51 million domestic. Oh, yeah. And Second 107. Weekend, Sam Bump. What was that? The second weekend is the Switchblade Sam Bump. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, 117 worldwide um, on a $35 million budget. And then poor old Last Action Hero dropped 47%, which was pretty big for 1993. Yeah, that's wow. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's Batman Returns. That's a Batman Returns drop. Um, yeah, but it didn't debut like Batman Returns either. It, exactly. It's, it's fifth place. Like, that's bad. Yeah. Like, yeah. Uh, Arnold movie uh, like that. <laughs> $8 million for a $30 million 10 day total. Coming in at fifth place was the wide expansion, the semi wide, of What's Love Got to Do with It, which we discussed last week. Mm -hmm. The film would expand to 1,091 theaters for a $5.48 million weekend, bringing its 17 day total to. 13.2 million dollars excuse me uh it would peak next weekend in terms of screen count and gross as it would turn out with 1100 theaters over the july 4th weekend um it would eventually earn 39 domestic uh other than that it's pretty much holdovers from may a cliffhanger in sixth place Made in America in seventh, Guilty of Sin in eighth, Menace to Society in ninth, and good old Dave still kicking along Ooh. in tenth place in its eighth <laughs> weekend of release. Do Dave it, ruled Dave. the summer. Do it, Dave. <laughs> I like how we're such big fans of the fact that Dave had made it in America and made a lot of money. <laughs> like these other ones, fine, good job for them. But Dave had made it in America, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, for the record. Uh, House of Cards opened in six theaters, earned a whopping $12,753 oh. to eventually earn a domestic total of $322,871. That they had to pay to the American Autism Association. Yeah. For apology, I assume. Possibly. <laughs> um, and that's the box office for the weekend. All right. And okay. uh, next weekend show, what the hell did I just do? I'll tell you in a little bit. 
Okay. So that'll do it for J- June 25th to 27th, which means June is complete for 1993. Um, <laughs> Scott and Aaron, thank you for uh, discussing these three wildly different films with me today. Uh, before we sign out, let people know where they keep up with you. Aaron? You can find me writing for We Live Entertainment for my movie reviews. I'm on Wise Blue for both Blu-ray and Criterion reviews. I host a podcast called Out Now with Aaron and Abe. My friend Abe and I discuss new movies on a weekly basis. We probably just talked about like Transformers or something this week. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm on Twitter at Aaron's PS4. All right, Scott. Uh, I'm at therap.com and I'm on Twitter at, at Scott Mendelson. And I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Brandon4KUHD, written work at YSOBlue.com. Next week, we have much ado about nothing as Polly Shore stands firm against the Seven Dwarves. <laughs> All that and more as the summer of 93 at 30 continue. It's the summer of 93 at 30. Thank you for listening. The Brandon Peters Show is a Creative Zombie Studios production. Produced by Brad Shoemaker and Brandon Peters. Written and edited by Brandon Peters. Announcer vocals by Jessica Alsman. Theme song by Metavari. Web design and show art by Brad Shoemaker with Brandon Peters. All music and clips featured in the episode are property of their respective studios and no infringement is intended. The Summer of and News Themes by Press Maxson. Additional information on this and other episodes at thebrandonpetershow.com. For any inquiries, press opportunities, or sponsorship, contact mail at thebrandonpetershow.com. The show is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere podcasts are found.